uh, we now have our third plenary for today, who is um, given by none other than Professor Lian Pin Ko. So Professor Lian Pin Ko brings with him 16 years of international research experience in sustainability and environmental science. He has formerly held positions such as the Swiss National Science Foundation Professor at ETH Zurich, Chair of Applied Ecology and Conservation at the University of Adelaide, as well as Vice President of Science Partnerships and Innovation at Conservation International Foundation. Today, he is back here in Singapore as the Director of NUS's Centre for Nature-Based Climate Solutions, which aims to conduct research aimed at informing climate policies, strategies, and actions in Singapore as well as the Asia-Pacific region. Today, he'll be sharing with us on how science can inform policy decisions on climate and biodiversity. Um, so once again, a gentle reminder, if you have any questions for Professor Ko uh, regarding his plenary, please post them in the chat and we will um, go through them after the plenary is done. So Professor Ko, if you're ready, the stage is yours. Yeah, all right. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Mark. Um, thank you. So before I begin, uh, just... Uh, I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to uh, to share some of my research and the research of my team uh, today. So I'll try to share screen. Hope you can see this. Yes. Okay, good, good. Okay, great. So um, I have quite a, I have quite a few slides and uh, not, not much time, so I'll just uh, jump right into it. Uh, as as Mark mentioned, uh, my name is Lian Pin. I am an applied ecologist and a professor uh, in the Faculty of Science at NUS, and the director of this new center that uh, Mark also mentioned. Uh, I will tell you more about the center towards the end of my presentation, but for now, uh, I, I would actually uh, like to focus on the, the science and talk about how science can help inform our decisions and policies when it comes to climate solutions and biodiversity conservation. So um, some of us here who are uh, old enough, unfortunately old enough, might, might remember a, a famous person uh, making this statement or infamous statement uh, back in around 2002. Um, he was of course talking about a completely different context but I think uh, sometimes it's useful to think about a subject matter or a problem in terms of what we know we know and also what we know we don't know. So for today's presentation, uh, this is how I will uh, structure it. I will talk about very briefly uh, what we know about climate change and nature-based solutions. Uh, then I'll talk about what we are beginning to find out uh, and finally, uh, talk a little bit about what we don't know, but urgently need to know. So uh, what do we know? I think we know the problem quite well. Uh, if we take the annual average temperature of our planet over the last 170 years, color code them on a temperature scale of blue to red, indicating uh, cooler to warmer temperatures, uh, this is what we would see. If we look at the data for individual countries in our region, uh, we see a similar trend. Now today, it's, it's not controversial anymore that our climate has been getting increasingly warmer at local, regional, and also global levels. We also know the cost of the problem quite well. Uh, it is, uh, uh, simply put, uh, the, the accumulation of carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in our atmosphere. In, on, on this graph, the blue line shows the uh, global annual emissions. Uh, it is now at about uh, 40 billion tons per year. The pink line shows global uh, carbon dioxide concentration, atmospheric concentration. It is now uh, over 400 parts per million. So we know the problem. We know the cause of the problem. I think we actually also know the solution. Uh, we basically have to reverse what we had done in the past 170 years by reducing our emissions to effectively zero. And according to the IPCC, we need to do that within the next 30 years or so if we are to achieve the Paris climate goal of limiting global warming to below 2 degrees Celsius uh, above pre-industrial levels. In fact, 
we need to go below net zero or zero to also reduce uh, carbon dioxide concentration in our atmosphere to start to, uh, to remove uh, CO2 in the, in the air. The blue lines you see uh, in this IPCC figure indicate different pathways for achieving the Paris target. If we unpack them a bit, they look something uh, like the four graphs on the, on the left. But don't worry about the details of the pathways. They are just uh, responses to different scenarios of how global society might develop over the next few decades. And from, for example, a low energy demand scenario, which is P1, to a high energy demand scenario, P4. For now, uh, let's just zoom in on pathway P3, which, uh, which represents a middle of the road scenario. Now, for the world to achieve net zero emissions by around uh, mid-century, all IPCC pathways require emissions to peak in 2020, which is this year, um, followed by rapid decarbonization. But most importantly, all pathways also require actions in the brown part of, of the curve. And the brown part of the, of the uh, curve uh, above the zero line represents opportunities to reduce emissions, mainly by avoiding deforestation. For example, uh, avoiding the loss of peatlands in Indonesia. The brown part of the curve below the zero line are opportunities for us to remove emissions, uh, capture CO2, mainly through the restoration of, uh, for example, mangroves and other blue carbon ecosystems. But these are the so-called nature-based climate solutions that some of us have been hearing quite a bit about. And scientists have estimated uh, recently that these solutions uh, have a climate mitigation potential of up to about 20 to 24 billion tons of, of CO2 per year. So nature-based solutions are important, but, but so what? You know, what does that mean uh, for society, for corporates and individuals? Well, I think the key take-home message uh, is this. Um, nature-based climate solutions are important, not just because they are something nice to do or that they, they tell a nice story, a good story. They are important because they are an integral part of the solution. And if you look at uh, these uh, IPCC pathways, the brown part, the nature-based part, are baked into every one of these pathways for us to achieve the Paris climate goal. In other words, even if we manage to decarbonize, uh, tackling the gray part of the curve, we would still fall short of our targets unless we also figure out the science and the practice of implementing these nature-based solutions, the brown part of, of every pathway. Okay, so let's move on to part two. What are we beginning to, to, to know, to find out? So another famous uh, person recently uh, made the statement that numbers don't lie. Now numbers don't lie, but, but they can change and they do change over time as we improve our understanding of the world uh, through science. So what I'm about to present to you are some preliminary research and findings from our center. I emphasize that these are preliminary findings. Uh, most are not yet published. Some may not even be publishable until we have more data. But these initial insights, uh, I think, are useful to help us understand what we should be focusing on as scientists and where the opportunities and, and risks might lie. So let's start with the issue of scale. The scale of the problem versus the scale of our solutions. In previous slides, we learned that global emissions is around 40 billion tons per year. Uh, on this uh, slide, I've also included the uh, emissions of China, US, Indonesia, and Singapore, just for some uh, perspective. We also know that the mitigation potential of nature-based climate solutions can be up to about 24 billion uh, tons per year, as I mentioned earlier as well. And within the universe of nature-based solutions, we know that the greatest potential lie in avoiding emissions by protecting uh, what we uh, still uh, have, our existing natural ecosystems. So the first thing that we did uh, 
at our center in NUS was to quantify the climate mitigation potential of protecting all tropical forests globally. And more specifically, we are interested in tropical forests that are facing imminent threat of loss and whereby an intervention could potentially avoid uh, that loss. And these are what we call investable forest carbon. So we find that the protection of these so-called investable tropical forests could generate carbon uh, uh, mitigation uh, benefits amounting to about 2 billion tons per year. Now these are mainly terrestrial forests on mineral soils, but they can also include forests on peatlands and mangroves. As you can see on this, uh, on this slide, um, the, uh, the amount of uh, climate mitigation that could uh, result from protecting these tropical forests is, is quite substantial and it may help countries and companies meet their emissions reduction goals or potentially be a source of tradable carbon credits. We then zoomed in on blue carbon because it's such a hot topic and everyone's talking about it and ran the same analysis specifically for the protection of mangrove forests uh, using more refined data sets specific to mangroves. We find that protecting mangroves as a solution has uh, a relatively small payoff in terms of global climate mitigation. It provides about 0.03 billion tons uh, per year of, of climate mitigation potential. However, as uh, I think everyone here understands, blue carbon or, or mangrove uh, conservation is still an important solution for, for the many other co-benefits it delivers, especially at the national and sub-national levels. And for the hundreds of millions of people living in these coastal areas whose lives and livelihoods depend on healthy coastal ecosystems. Now, because our analysis is spatially explicit, we are also able to produce a wall-to-wall -wall map to show where this potential lies. And we find that much of this potential would come from the Americas and Asia. Uh, in fact, the Americas could generate about 0.8 billion tons of investable carbon per year. The number for Asia is around 0.6 billion tons per year. And at the country level, Brazil has the largest investable carbon stock at close to half a billion tons per year. Indonesia is second place uh, and the uh, other countries in the top five are Bolivia, DRC and Malaysia. Now from a conservation, a biodiversity conservation perspective, uh, this map is, is also very interesting and important because it also tells us where forests are under threat and and where we can invest to avoid the loss of both carbon and biodiversity by protecting these forests. And it's also important to note that not all investable forests are profitable forest carbon, right? As, as you know, a project's financial viability depends on a wide range of factors, including the, the price of carbon, um, the density of carbon on that land, costs of establishment, maintenance and operations, and so on. So to help us understand the scale of the uh, potential returns on investment from these, uh, these forest carbon projects that we have mapped out, we also produced what is essentially a prospecting map. But in this case, instead of prospecting for precious metals or oil and gas, it is a map that could help us uh, or help investors prospect for carbon. And we find that the vast majority of financially viable and most profitable carbon sites are actually located in Asia, in our part of the world, with a combined uh, return of, of close to $25 billion per year in, not pre in, in net present value. Uh, and forest carbon projects in Indonesia alone could generate up to about $10 billion per year in returns. So these potential returns may be quite substantial from a carbon finance uh, perspective as well. However, and, and interestingly, these returns are from only about 20% of the investable forest carbon sites. The vast majority of investable sites are, actu uh, are actually not financially viable at our starting carbon price of about five, uh, five to $6 per ton. And that's indicated by all the yellow parts on, on this map. And so from a conservation perspective, 
we need to we need other policy interventions to protect these unprofitable and yet threatened uh, forests. Now, another important consideration is that the theoretical potential for climate mitigation can be quite different from what they may be uh, actually achievable on the ground, because there will always be uh, practical constraints that are specific to the local or regional contexts uh, that need to be considered. To talk about constraints, uh, let me switch gears slightly and focus on reforestation as a climate solution. So previously I've been talking about protection uh, and now I'm switching gears to talk about reforestation. Recently, we also mapped the uh, potential for reforestation in Southeast Asia. We find that in our region, there are uh, close to about 121 million hectares of degraded terrestrial forests, peat swamp forests and mangroves that are biophysically suitable for reforestation. And the restoration of these degraded lands could potentially, potentially remove close to about 3.4 billion tons of CO2 per year. Um, however, these so-called degraded lands may in fact be in use by local communities uh, as smallholder farmlands or home gardens. So appropriating these lands for restoration or reforestation may compromise the livelihoods, the food security, and the land rights of these land users. Furthermore, reforestation may require constant site maintenance and protection against threats, including tree diebacks, logging, forest fires, and so on. We find that as we start to apply these, lift, these different layers of constraints, the picture starts to change as well. You know, the amount of land that is practically available for reforestation can quickly shrink from what was thought to be over 120 million hectares to less than 8 million hectares across the region. And in the most constrained scenario, reforestation might only remove less than 0.25 billion tons of CO2 per year, which is literally a fraction of the uh, unconstrained potential. And therefore, it is really important to develop better ways of quantifying, mapping, and uh, monitoring both the potential and, and constraints of these nature-based solutions to inform decisions and, and also to prioritize our investments to get us the biggest bang for our buck. So why should we care about these new knowledge and insights? I, I think these insights are important because they tell us where uh, the opportunities are for countries in our region. And at the same time, it also alerts us to what some of the constraints and risks might be. Um, and so I think it's, it makes good sense for us to invest in producing policy relevant science in this area and uh, for, for you know, uh, the, the research institutions in our region to serve as knowledge hubs for climate solutions uh, for our region. So let's continue on to part three. Um, what are some of the priority research questions we are tackling next? In the next few slides, I will quickly run through some of our up upcoming research projects. Now, I'm sure everyone here understands that nature-based solutions are important, not just for climate mitigation, but they're also hugely important for the many other ecosystem services and benefits uh, they provide to society, including biodiversity conservation, ensuring clean air and water, protecting our topsoil, safeguarding food security, protecting us against uh, extreme weather events, uh, sustaining uh, coastal livelihoods, and so on. So our team at NUS is also working on quantifying and mapping the co-benefits of nature-based solutions in our region. Among the many co-benefits of nature-based solutions, um, biodiversity is particularly interesting because it is both a co-benefit and a building block of healthy ecosystems. Right? When we invest in protecting a forest, we protect its biodiversity. Uh, conversely, a high diversity of animals, of plants, of microbes in the forest ensures that the forest uh, continues to perform its uh, vital ecosystem functions, not only to sustain itself, but also to deliver ecosystem services to humans, including, of course, the services of carbon sequestration and storage. So this value of biodiversity is currently not properly reflected or internalized in carbon pricing. At the moment, for example, one ton of carbon from a monoculture is priced the same as one ton of carbon from a highly diverse and pristine rainforest. So our team is exploring ways uh, to quantify the price premium of this beautiful carbon um, to properly value 
the, the carbon from, from uh, pristine rainforests or, or pristine natural ecosystems. So far, we have focused on green carbon, uh, which are terrestrial forests, and blue carbon, which are the mangroves and seagrass meadows and, and so on. But there are obviously also several other kinds of high carbon ecosystems that have received less attention, including teal carbon, which are the freshwater swamp forests and, and peat swamp forests, uh, as well as gold carbon, which are the macroalgae or seaweeds. And more importantly, we also need to understand the interconnectedness and interdependence between these uh, ecosystems. So the center is also investing in new, uh, new uh, researchers and expertise and infrastructure resources, uh, as well as collaborating with other researchers in Singapore and the region to study the climate mitigation benefit and co-benefits of these other high carbon uh, ecosystems. Now, nature-based climate solutions are promising, but they are certainly not without risks. Uh, there are three big risks in particular. In terms of forest protection, it can be challenging to benchmark additionality. Now, to understand what would happen, uh, for example, if not for this intervention. For example, in the threat, if the threat of deforestation was inflated, then this investment uh, would not deliver the full extent of its intended outcome. So it's very important to understand uh, what, what would otherwise have happened and what, what is the added value or benefit of implementing this forest protection uh, action. Alternatively, if the threat is real, say because the forest is sitting on very productive lands for agriculture, then the pressure to develop the land will always be there. How can we ensure the permanence of the solution right after the pro project has ended and the credits are retired? And finally, there is also the risk of development being diverted elsewhere. In our highly globalized and telecoupled society, it can be challenging to, to mitigate this risk of, of so-called leakage. Therefore, it is important to also develop better ways of accounting for these risks uh, to inform decisions and to prioritize our solutions. So far, I've been talking quite a bit about what we have been doing as a center. And so now I will switch gears and talk about who we are and, and what we are. Um, the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions is a new research facility at NUS in Singapore. And with this center, we are bringing together researchers from across different disciplines, departments, faculties, and even universities to pool our resources and expertise uh, to work towards a common goal. The research interests and expertise of uh, our center, uh, the center's researchers are very diverse. They include marine biology, mangrove ecology, forest ecology, uh, as far as conservation science, remote sensing, spatial prioritization, environmental policy governance, and law. The center is investing in five strategic areas of research. I won't go into the details of, of these research uh, topics or themes, but just very quickly, uh, they include understanding the impacts of climate change in the region, not just the direct impacts, but also the indirect impacts, uh, for example, uh, uh, impacts on society through, through uh, compromise, by compromising our food security and water security and so on. We are also investing in understanding, uh, identifying uh, solutions and, and constraints of these solutions, or including some of the work that I've shown you uh, in earlier slides. We are interested in barriers. Now, what are some of the economic and uh, societal and po policy barriers to the uptake and implementation of these solutions? We want to be able to prioritize our solutions. And of course, we're also uh, very interested in how technology could be helped to not only help us uh, in our research, but also to implement these solutions. We uh, use a wide range of research techniques to tackle these uh, research questions. Uh, we collect empirical data through lab work, field work, and remote sensing. And those data sets are critical for our analytical work to, to map, to monitor, to inform uh, the optimization and prioritization of uh, these nature-based solutions. Uh, in our center, our top priority is to produce uh, evidence-based, interdisciplinary, and uh, policy-relevant science to help involve, inform climate strategies, policies, and actions in Singapore and the region. Our second and equally important goal is to build capacity to empower society and its leaders to respond appropriately and decisively to climate challenges and, and also to new opportunities. 
So obviously we can't do this alone. Uh, we have been very proactively engaging with various stakeholders in Singapore and internationally. And these potential partners come from different sectors, including academia, NGOs, government agencies, and corporates. Uh, so I'm also very keen, or we are also very keen to uh, explore opportunities to collaborate, to work together, uh, and even to train uh, some of the uh, participants uh, of, of this Congress today. So very happy for uh, you to reach out to us uh, and to explore opportunities for doing so. And with that, I'd like to uh, stop here and uh, thank you for your attention and uh, happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, Professor Ko, for your plenary speech. Uh, we open the floor to questions. May I start? Thank you, Yim Ping. Um, you talked about evidence-based science, and when it comes to biodiversity in the region, let's say um, rainforest, how would you measure the, di the biodiversity in the region? Well, there, there are, I think there are uh, already a lot of established uh, methods and techniques for measuring biodiversity, uh, a lot of the field techniques especially. And but what we are hoping to do uh, at the center is to develop uh, or to integrate um, uh, technology-based uh, approaches for doing so, uh, so that we can reduce the cost of, of, um, of measuring and monitoring biodiversity at scale, not just for Singapore or any particular country or, or, or field site, but across the region and in fact, across the tropics. Uh, and therefore we're investing in uh, a lot of remote sensing uh, products uh, and, and technologies uh, and integrating that with uh, field-based uh, methods of, of measuring biodiversity uh, using uh, various machine learning uh, platforms and techniques to try to build models that would allow us to uh, be able to sense um, and measure biodiversity remotely uh, by relying on, uh, on satellite-based or or airborne or drone-based uh, remote sensing data uh, with the intention or the goal of being able to measure and monitor these bi uh, biodiversity very cost-effectively uh, and, and at high frequency. Because ultimately we are, I think as scientists, we are racing against time, right? Not just because of climate change, but also because of land use change. So we need to come up with uh, um, very cost-effective and, and very uh, efficient ways of, of, of monitoring what we currently have. And also to monitor how well, um, our reforestation efforts are, are working uh, in not just in terms of regrowing a forest, but also in terms of bringing back uh, plants and animals and other, uh, other wildlife in, into those new forests. Mm -hmm. So uh, to follow up, as uh, a lot of us in the department and the audience are molecular side and macro side, right? So the biodiversity conservation measurement methods, uh, it sounded to me like a um, a bit of macro approach. How do you have any uh, plan to reconcile this macro versus uh, micro scale? I mean, in, when it comes to the resolution in terms of the species number and so on. Yeah, I think there can be many metrics of, of biodiversity uh, and, and at different levels. Um, so when I say, uh, you know, when I was talking about integrating remotely sensed data, biodiversity data with uh, field-based uh, measurements, uh, I think the field-based part also could include uh, uh, molecular techniques, right, eDNA and, and so on. Uh, and especially when when uh, we're talking about understanding biodiversity of microbes uh, in, mm -hmm. in the soil, for example, underground, below ground, which which is which is really important, uh, mm -hmm. not, not just for understanding biodiversity, but also understanding this, you know, how those microbes are contributing to carbon sequestration or storage as well mm -hmm. uh, in relation to climate change. So. In integrating, by integrating all these different uh, levels of biodiversity, uh, different ways of measuring biodiversity with uh, what I would say the, uh, the most scalable uh, platform, which, is, which in my mind is still uh, remote sensing. And by, by building models that would allow us to uh, get at the and various metrics of biodiversity, eventually based on remotely sensed data, 
we can then very quickly and cost effectively measure and monitor mm -hmm. biodiversity across the region um, okay. for the reasons I mentioned uh, mm -hmm. uh, earlier. Mm -hmm. Thank you for your answer. Thank you, Professor, for your question. Uh, we have one more question from Laura to Professor Cole. Uh, is Southeast Asia still the region with the best potential for building up sequestered carbon after accounting for the constraints you mentioned, such as food security? Yeah, I, I think so. Um, the constraints I mentioned are not uh, unique to Southeast Asia, right? When Because we're talking about, uh, essentially about uh, how we use the land. And whenever we talk about land use, uh, there will always be competing priorities, right? Society needs to... Uh, uh, Sorry, <laughs> maybe I'll continue. So there will always be competing priorities. Um, so it's not unique to Southeast Asia. Um, in, in terms of the uh, amount of, of carbon, of forest and carbon stocks that are still, uh, uh, that, that, that still remains across the tropics, I think uh, depending on what particular ecosystem you're talking about, but in most cases, I think Southeast Asia is still uh, a very rich and diverse uh, area when it comes to um, our remaining tropical ecosystems, particularly, uh, I, I think, in terms of the coastal ecosystems, uh, mangroves, for example. Um, so, so I think from, from the findings of our preliminary, preliminary research, and, and as you have seen earlier in my slides, um, Southeast Asia is one of the highest, uh, uh, has, has, has the highest potential in terms of uh, of nature-based of nature-based solutions from protecting our remaining tropical forests, and it also has the highest potential in terms of generating uh, returns, uh, uh, not not just climate-wise or biodiversity-wise, but also financially economic returns for for investors that are willing to invest in protecting our forests. Uh, thank you, Prof, for your answer. Uh, uh, thank you, Prof, for your answer. So we have um, come to the end of uh, our plenary. Thank you all so much for your questions. And thank you, of course, to Professor Cole for your excellent plenary speech. Uh, we will be in touch uh, regarding the memento for the plenary. Uh,